Anybody like to do chores? No. Oh. Yeah. So we had two boys um, under two, and um, it was a rough road. But as they started to grow, I figured out something. We all live here. And because we all live here, we all should do our part to take care of where we live. Now, I'm an avid believer that you should take care of what God has blessed you with. I believe in being a good steward. I don't care what it is. It's not about how much money you have. It's not about, you know, you don't have to have the finest, but you should take care of everything that God has blessed you with. And so we started teaching our kids real young that you have to have some ownership in this. You have to understand that we all live here. And so we start handing out chores real early because I want you to feel what I feel when I got to do all the work by myself and all the mothers said, amen. amen. And so we start teaching them, you know, pick up after yourself. However you treat what you have is going to qualify you for God to give you more. Yes. Uh-oh. And so we are very meticulous. I am, I'm OCD, pray for me. Um, about my surroundings. I believe everything has a place and put it in its place. Don't just do things any kind of way because your upkeep is your thank you or your disregard to God. So how do I say thank you outside of just saying it with my mouth? I say it with my life. I say it with how I do. When I have my cars, my cars are clean. I, I don't have french fries under my seat. I promise. I don't. <laughs> And I get it, we got small kids, and there were seasons when I did have french fries under my seat, but I would still try to make sure I kept it in the best shape possible because it is my thank you for what I have. I don't take anything for granted, and God doesn't owe me anything. And so we begin to teach that. So we spread out chores. So there's some chores I haven't done in a long time because I don't have to because that's what I got kids for. But I remember when we first moved uh, to out, out here, we moved to Northfield over on Magnolia, and it was a small house, but I loved it. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Three bedrooms, two bathrooms, it was, it was fabulous. I was content with Jesus, happy in Jesus alone. And my son came home and he was like, I wanna live on Firestone. I said, first of all, where is Firestone? So I had to go find out where Firestone, he said, see them big houses over there? I wanna live in them houses. I said, well, son, if that's where you want to live, you have to take care of this house as it was that house. You have to upkeep, you have to wash dishes, you have to vacuum, you have to show God that if I take care of the little things, that I qualify for more. I'm preaching already, this ain't where I'm going. This is just the opening story. And so I, I showed them, so you would see them for the most part, they would vacuum and they would try to keep their room clean. One of them clean the bathroom, the other one would clean the kitchen. And so we've had this rhythm going and guess what? We, we live on Firestone. And so it made an impact in their lives how you take care of what you have as a thank you to God. And so when we got in a bigger house, you know, bigger house take more work. And so now we had more chores. And so everybody has spread up. Now we, we got pool, we got a bunch of stuff we got to take care of that we didn't have to do before. But we all understood that we all live here and it takes all of us to care for this house. Well, then Johnny Cage went to school. And I went to run around fussing about why stuff wasn't done and I realized... Somebody had to pick up the slack because now he was no longer there. So now I had to put some more stuff on my plate that I ain't been used to doing, Chris, in a long time. But I was not going to let it be undone because, again, how we keep our house is our thank you to our God. And so we've been on this series, and we're coming to an end. Last, next week will be the last week, and then we're going to go into another series. But we've been talking about family, the beautiful mess. And we started a long time ago, probably about eight weeks ago. If you haven't been a part, go back to our YouTube channel. All of the sermons are on there. But we talked about all things concerning family. We talked about blended families. We talked about communication. Communication is probably one of the best sermons on there. And not just because I preached it, I live it. 
And we talked about how we only say things that render grace to the hearer. And if we start practicing that in our families and our households, we won't have as many arguments and disagreements and all this other stuff as we do if we just watch what comes out of our mouth. But we talked about blended families, we talked about all of these things. And last, so we took a shift last week, not just your personal family, and Pastor Angela took us into the family of God. And unfortunately, the family of God has gotten a bad rap. And so today, we need to understand, as she reminded us last week, it's not surprising that as the biological family has lost its value and importance in society, so has the spiritual family. How many, have, how many times have you heard, or maybe you've even believed, that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian? Yeah. Uh-huh. Or, or church is not important that you can work it out in yourself, and it's about the relationship. And it is, but there's some pieces that we are missing when we don't do it the way that it was set up. So let, let's get to it. We want to talk about the role of the family in the church. The family has a role in the church. Now, I know all of the things that I've heard, well, it's not the church ain't the building, the church is the people. You're absolutely right. The word, of church, the word church in the Bible comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which means a called out company or assembly. Wherever it is used in the Bible, it refers to the people. You are the church. However, in Acts, right after Pentecost, remember we celebrated Pentecost, it was the church's birthday, immediately following the indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon all believers, the believers began to meet. So, while the church is the people, the building houses the people which houses the church. So when we get to this this new age thinking, and it's it's really in our younger generations and some other people that the church is not necessary, then there is no other organization that you belong to that you don't meet. I mean, I just walked, I went down Bedford the other day. (laughs) Yesterday, we was walking down the street, driving down the street, and I saw all these witch hats, okay? And so I saw three, and I was like, oh, that's different. Then I looked on the other side, and it was three more. And I said, now, what's what's going on around here? Pulled up whole witch convention outside, whole festival. (laughs) Real deal. I wasn't super spiritual. I drove on past. Whatever y'all got, I want none. (laughs) But... You meet, you come together, like minds come together, you fellowship together, whether it's a sorority, whether it's a fraternity, whether it's whatever it is, if you are a part of anything, you cannot be a part separate. So we have to understand that Christianity is a corporate matter and the Christian life can be fully realized only in relationship to others. Who we are is all about somebody else. We work it out amongst each other. We are one anothering one another. That's what Pastor Angela said last week. This is not about you. This is about someone else. You receive benefits Because just like it's not about them, they care for you. And when it's not about you, you care for them. And if it's done right in the right context, guess what? Everybody is taken care of. That's kind of how it's supposed to work in marriage. If I take care of you and lay my life down and you lay your life down, nobody is neglected because both of us have picked up each other's lives. So understanding that I cannot fully experience or fully realize this Christian walk, this relationship with Jesus that I say I have, if I am not in community with someone else. And they'll they'll argue you down, you are the church, you right, but even as I am the church, there is a building that we should all be meeting in together. There's a place where we should all be coming 
together. I remember when we were younger, you was in church all day, every day. I remember Sunday service started at Sunday school and then morning service. And morning service would last so long they'd have to feed you afterwards. And then you take a nap, you go home and you take a nap and you come back for night service. We have figured out how to condense this thing to an hour and we got less participation now than we had back then when it consumed your entire life. Monday night prayer night, Tuesday night power night, Wednesday night rehearsal, Thursday night willing workers. I still don't know what they did. And then Friday night was youth night, but it was only old people there. I'm just trying to say. Don't shoot the messenger, I'm just preaching. But yet we have learned better and we understand that no, you don't have to be consumed in the church. More of our life should be happening outside of the church, but there is a place you should come in for a refill. You can get a Tesla, and if you notice now, they got charging stations. Come on, I'm preaching already. All over the place, because on your journey, you're going to run out. Yes, you may have a charging station at home, but that charge at home may not take you as far as you need to go. You may have to stop along the way to get a, a refill. This thing has to be worked out in the context of others. And so we're going to go to Hebrews 10 because I need to show it to you in the scriptures about what is the concept of coming together and being the church with the people who are the church in the building that is the church. So Hebrew says this, this is another translation, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Can I tell you, these people, people who you choose to be in community with, they push you to love and to good deeds. Oh, y'all don't believe that. You ever dealt with somebody difficult? Dealing with difficult personalities, people that don't look like you, don't sound like you, don't believe like you, it causes your love to go to another level. It pushes you on to good works because I don't know, like, I don't know about you, I don't feel like doing the right thing all the time. See, in the 8 o'clock service, I had Darrell, he was with me. I know y'all been saved all your life and y'all running for your life and, and Jesus on your side and you're happy and all that. I get that. But there are some times when my flesh acts up and I don't feel like doing what was right. I need to come in here to be reminded of the scripture, to be reminded by my brother and my sister that trouble don't last always, that you have to forgive and forgiveness is not for you, it's not for them, it's for you. And it's not letting people off the hook, it's putting them on God's hook. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay, and therefore I don't have to worry about the repercussion for anything that I may do in retaliation. But I have to come in this assembly to be reminded of that. I have to come in here to be reminded that trouble don't last. Always, I have to be here to be with like-minded believers. You had a tough week, yeah, I had a tough week, yeah, but the devil is defeated. Yeah, girl, he sure is. Come on, let's lift our hands to the Lord. See, on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Some of the other scripture says, forsake not the assembly of the saints especially as the day approaches what day are we talking about you do know we're in the last days now I don't know if Jesus is coming in the next five minutes five years ten years 25 years I'm really not concerned because the rapture is the least of my worries Amen. see when you when when you already know your name is in the book you don't got a lot of time worried about him I'm not scared that he's coming I'm glad that he's coming but I'm trying to do all the work I'm supposed to do right now before he decides to crack the sky so I'm not really worried about that, but I am worried about staying in my rightful place, working out my soul salvation. How do we work out our soul salvation with one another? Forsake not the assembling together, especially now when a time where they tell you don't assemble. 
it's not safe. There are viruses, there are monkey pox and all this other stuff happening. They're telling you to stay away from one another when one another is how we work it out. But the problem is because we have con miscommunicated what church really is, a lot of these places that are popping up are not churches at all, they're cults. And you've been hurt in a cult and you blamed it on the church. See, it's because of the failure of leadership and failure of one another that we have lost faith in the church that we believe that all the preachers is taking the money and all the preachers is committing adultery and all the preachers that ain't happening up in this church but the enemy has us so fooled because you thought you were going to church when you were going to a cult it's a few things up here you can take a picture we'll put it up on this on the website but See, understanding what the church is supposed to be. It's an open place for questions. People question me all the time, and I'm not offended. That's why I study. So when you have the question, I can come back and show you where I got it from. What I give you on a Sunday morning is a summary of weeks of study. I don't have enough time, and you ain't gonna let me, to give you all that I got on a specific subject. So just because I didn't completely say scripture verse or whatever it is, if you want to know, I can produce it for you. If you go to a church where you can't ask no questions, something is wrong with that. Or if you question the leadership, they make you feel like you're the stupidest person in the room. Or if you have an environment where questions are not encouraged, then fear reigns. See, understanding what God's church is supposed to look like. The, the doctrine is verified. This is thing is from centuries. It's in there. It's in the Bible. We're free to form our own conclusions. This is a beautiful thing about our church. We all don't look alike. We all don't say the same things. We all don't vote the same. None of that. But we do agree that Jesus is the good news, that the gospel reigns. And as long as we're not fighting about that, everything else is up for grabs. And we make better decisions when we make them in diversity and with people that don't look and think like us. But it's easier to go somewhere where people look like you, talk like you, be like you. That's not a church, that's a cult. The church that God created is emphasis on unity. I'm gonna get to that next week. And they are not elitist. Can, I'm gonna hit this and I'm, I'm gonna move on. The church has a bad rap right now because we tend to be judgmental and look down on people. We tend to turn our nose up on sin and all of that other stuff. The truth of the matter is, but for the grace of God, just because she got pregnant and you didn't, didn't mean that y'all ain't do the same thing. Y'all trying to push me, don't push me. See, there, there's no room for being judgmental. There's no room. My job is to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, him crucified, and that we are justified by faith through grace. That's all. It's not anything that I've done, that I need, that I've earned it, that it should be. You didn't earn it. I didn't earn it. But we always try to tell people where they're going and how they're going to get there. This is not an elitist society. This is the church that God has called us to be. Move on, pastor. See, understanding here at Faith Fellowship Church, we do have a vision. We are multicultural, multi-generational church of individuals and families becoming one family in God. Unity is imperative and it is hard to fight right now because the D word is a cuss word. It's diversity. It has taken on all these different meanings, and that's not what it simply means. It means that we can walk together no matter what color we are, no matter what, what uh, financial status we have, no matter what our differences is, it is even show you how beautiful God is in all of his colors and all of his, 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 his beauty. But the enemy wants to do what he does, and we already know he's the divider. 
So now we have this whole set of Christianity that's coming up that don't need church, that don't need community, that they're fighting, for, they're, 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 they're doing this thing on their own. And here's what the problem is with that. It's because when we come in here, the family's role in the church, what happens in community, number one, is you can be loved and you can love others practically. It's in here where love is in action. It's in here where we show people how, how they are to be loved and we receive love. You get a hug when you come in. You ain't had a hug all week, but somebody wants to love you. They want to care for you. They want to be around you. We want to walk with you. That's what we do in here. When you are on your own, who's there? Serving one another, alleviating the suffering where possible. You don't have to walk alone. When you hurt, I hurt. I'm going to walk with you. When you lose a loved one, when something has happened, marriage is in trouble, we are people that are going to come around you. We're not going to get in your business. We don't, don't want to know how, what happened. We don't care nothing about that. We want to make sure you're okay. What do we need to do to get you healed, to get you on your way? That's what happens when you belong to the community, when you belong to the church. We receive teaching and we are equipped and stimulated to do the good works God called us to do. Every now and then, I need to hear a message to remind me of why I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to be reminded to take a look at myself because I've gone left over on this side. I need to remind that before I take a speck out of somebody else's eye, I need to get the plank out of, out of my own eye. We are to share our struggles and others who will help us bear burdens. We have to understand that the church is a net. The family strengthens the net. When you look at the church being a net, it's like, have you ever seen gym, uh, the circus with the trapeze and all that other stuff? And they're doing all this stuff up in the sky and all this great stuff. But if you look down, there is a net there. So that if they slip or if they fall, that it won't be to their demise. There is somebody there. There's something there to catch them. The church is the same thing. While the family strengthen the net, we catch anything that falls through the net. There's nothing like losing a loved one and not having a church to surround you. Where you got to find or pay somebody to speak over you. Where you, you, you no, there's no relationships there. There's nobody to help you in those times of need. But the net is, we've had people here that have lost parents, children who have lost parents to COVID and we were the net that was able to catch them and surround them and give them what they need. Or there's people who houses have set on fire, we were able to put them in houses. And, and people who have fallen short in this area, marriages that are falling apart, we were able to walk with them. Because that's what the net does. Tanner texts me something. It said to the fact, this is the only way net works. Everybody want to talk about networking and getting it. This is the way that net works. It is a place. But if the net is not strengthened, people will fall. They will fall to their demise. The most important thing in church, you are. We can't be the church without you. We can't do what we do in this community without you. And we've convinced ourselves we don't need, we don't, we don't need no church. You don't need to come to church. You don't need to. Yes, you do. Whether you're clicking in online or you coming in through those doors, you need to be a part of the net because it's only right for you to provide support for someone else. And then they'll be there when you need support. We've taken for granted what God has set up to be. A place that we can come and love on one another and hear the gospel and be there for one another. I was standing in the eight o'clock service. There's somebody who may need some place to stay and I got a realtor in, 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 my, in, in my 8.30 service. Of course, I'm gonna call that person and say, hey, you got some houses, I got this happening. It's, it's networking, but it's how the net works right here. 
but it's not fair for you to come take and you don't give. And I ain't even talking about money. I mean, you could put that there if you want to, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you're here to provide your services as well to someone else that may be in need. That's what the church is about. It's not about smoke and mirrors and great worship teams and you done had a good time and you go on about your way. It's not about any of that. See, when we really act like the family of God, then the church becomes the family that carries other families to Jesus. There are so many other families right here in this community that need to be carried to Jesus, but we got to make sure we have enough strength in our neck to carry them. So I know this, one, uh, this message wasn't for you. I'm just giving you all this so you can take it and tell somebody else. So when the argument comes up of why you go to church and you are the church, you're right, I am. But there is a place that we come together. We fight to be a multicultural church. Why do I say that? Because everybody does not believe that we can worship together and not look like each other that we can sit with people that we may not vote like, that we may not agree with. But as long as we agree about who Jesus is and the gospel, that's the only agreement we need, but we are better when we learn from each other, learn other people's experiences, see the world do through different eyes. We make better decisions. We become that place. Can I tell you, I love my church. And I would go to this church even if I wasn't a pastor. This would be the church for me. It was the church for me before I was the pastor. And it wasn't about who was on this platform. It wasn't about who was in leadership. It was about the way the people loved me. See, they loved me back. See, I was through with this. I've been damaged in one of them cults. I've been hurt. I've been abused. And I came here to hide on that back row, right over there where Noreen is. And I told God, I don't got a problem with you, but I got a problem with your people. So I'm going to sit right back there in that chair. And they came and they were afraid to pray for me. They would ask if they could pray for me. I was evil. I was mean. But the, the people surrounded me, people like Nell, people like Sue, Jill. They, they, they surrounded me enough like Pastor John said, to use the opportunity to get me to Jesus to heal. That's what happened in church. So I stand before you today, not because I've had it all together, but because this church loved me back. It is only right that I teach and that I raise up a people after that same kind of love that loved me back. You are important. Your gifts, your talents, your money, all of that strengthens the net to be able to heal people broken like me. Now they didn't know 12 years ago, who has been a long time, that I would eventually be standing here. Just like you don't know who walks through that door and 
what God intends for their lives and who they're going to be. Our job is to be the net and to love them and to love them and get them to where Jesus is. We don't use the word membership here anymore. We use partnership. Come along and grab your end of the net because somebody's family is going to be changed. Your family is going to be changed. You are going to be changed. You are the most important thing in this church. Father God, we lift our hands to you today. We thank you for reminding us our purpose and what we're called to do. That we don't just throw church away because of all the antics and all the crazy stuff that's happened, but we find true men and women of God with your heart that will raise up a people, that will love one another, that will secure the net to be able to catch anything that falls, anything that the enemy is trying to cast down to be the security for the family careful to give your name all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and give the Lord a shout. Now I want you to say it all week. I love